Thank you for joining us this afternoon for today's educational webinar, Optimizing Design of Watercraft with Hybrid and Battery Electric Drives. I'm Scott Thibault from ATA Engineering, your host, and we have three speakers today, uh, Maged Ismail from Siemens, Dr. Miles Wheeler from Siemens, and also from Siemens, Pete Schalderbrand. And we'll be uh, going over their particular uh, topics as we proceed with today's webinar. Before we begin, I would like to give a brief introduction to ATA Engineering, the sponsor of today's webinar. So who is ATA Engineering? ATA Engineering is an employee-owned small business with about 200 employees. Uh, we are principally engineers with subject matter experts recognized by uh, professional societies like uh, SEM, ASME, AIAA, and many others. ATA Engineering provides high-value engineering services to help our customers solve their toughest product design challenges. We work in a wide variety of fields, including aerospace and defense, maritime, spacecraft, hypersonics and composites, themed entertainment, and many others. We provide our services from our offices across the United States. Our headquarters is in San Diego, California, and we have branch offices in Los Angeles, the Bay Area, Albuquerque, Denver, Huntsville, Alabama, where I am myself located, and Washington, DC. Our services are principally in the areas of design, analysis, and test, but ATA Engineering is also a Siemens Platinum Level Solution Partner. Working with Siemens, we offer a wide variety of software solutions to our clients, including NX, NASTRAN, VMAP, StarCCM+, SimCenter 1D or AIMSIM, SimCenter 3D, Team Center, and many others. We provide hotline support uh, to our clients from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And we also provide training and training materials. In fact, uh, the training materials for Siemens NASTRAN are actually developed and supported by ATA Engineering, and many of the Siemens classes on NASTRAN are taught by our instructors. We are an expert partner recognized by Siemens with validated expertise in FEMAP, Star CCM Plus, and SimCenter 3D. If you'd like to learn more about the products that we sell and support from Siemens, visit us at our website shown here, and you can also uh, contact us through the contact us page on ata-e.com. Today's webinar is going to be presented by three presenters, all from Siemens. Uh, the first is Maged Ismail, who is Sim Center Portfolio Executive for Siemens for the Aerospace Defense Federal and Marine Sector. Uh, Maged is going to give us a quick overview of trends in the marine industry, particularly for electric and, uh, uh, and hybrid drives, and what the implications are for the market and for our customers. Next will be Dr. Miles Wheeler, Senior Marine Application Specialist from Siemens, who's going to be showing us ways of modeling uh, these marine craft with hybrid and electric drives uh, with a sophisticated model of the water flow around the, uh, around the vessels and its impact on powering, as well as the 1D simulation of the power plant. And wrapping up today's session will be Pete Schalderbrand, Applications Engineer from Siemens for Test and Measurement Solutions. And uh, Pete will be talking to us about the measurement and characterization of pass-by noise using Siemens test hardware and software. So at this point, I would like to turn over the floor to Maged for his uh, discussion of trends in the marine industry for hybrid and battery electric drives. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. I'm uh, sharing my screen now. I think that's uh, coming through okay as well. It is. Thank you. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, again, uh, I'm Magad Esmail, and I'm responsible for uh, the SimCenter portfolio uh, of simulation and test solutions 
uh, with focus on, on the marine industry as well as aerospace and defense. Um, so in you know, the, the next few minutes, I'd like to just give a brief overview of some of the trends we, we are seeing in this uh, industry segment. Uh, particularly when it comes to electrification and um, you know hybrid and electric powertrains, um, and you know what are the implications of those trends and, and how we can help um, both designers as well as designers of electric powertrains um, deliver better products uh, to, to this market. So um, starting with you know some of the key trends we see in the industry, um, really many boat builders now are realizing the, um, the opportunity as well as the challenge uh, that the market is asking for more sustainable low emission solutions um, that are environmentally friendly, that take advantage of the advances in, uh, in the EV technology. Um, and what this means is there's also a lot of competition in this space. So both startups uh, as well as traditional uh, boat builders and engine uh, providers um, are investing a lot of resources to come up with a, um, you know, a, a more uh, efficient, reliable solution to the market first. Um, and we, we are seeing already uh, some players in this space, uh, you know, starting to release their first products. Um, and one of the reasons um, the the um, interest in um, you know, electric and hybrid power trains is been um, going up over the last few years is essentially the reduction in the in the cost of batteries uh, and, you know, taking advantage of, you know, the several decades of technology development from the automotive industry in this space. Uh, of course, there's still a lot of pressure to deliver a cost effective uh, solution uh, for a, a market that's very sensitive to, to cost as we know. So, the boat builders uh, really need to innovate more, uh, think kind of outside of the box of, of the traditional ways they um, develop and design um, their, you know, kind of uh, their engineering processes and their products. And, you know, to, to be able to kind of, you know, address these trends, we may want to ask, you know, how can, you know, engineering teams um, develop these sustainable, sustainable products while at the same time reducing the overall development time, cost, and risks. Um, so, you know, we can think particularly about the uh, typical engineering challenges uh, and, you know, the implications for the trends we discussed that needs to be balanced uh, to go from traditional design to full electric solutions. And the first of those, of course, is hydrodynamic optimization. So, um, given um, the the um, the need for um, uh, essentially more um, you know efficient operation, taking into account range, um, you know as well as the speed of of charging the batteries, uh, you know cutting down the the uh, the energy needs uh, of the boat is uh, definitely definitely of significant importance, uh, more so for electric powertrains. Um, and then in terms of choosing uh, or sizing the battery uh, that is proper for the, the application, as well as, you know, thermal management and safety of those battery across the different um, operating ranges uh, becomes very important. Um, typically, one of the advantages of electric drivetrains is the fact that they have generally lower noise. Uh, but we also have to take into account, uh, of course, compared to diesel engines. Um, but we have to take into account the the the, the point that uh, you know high pitched uh, uh, noise or whistles, uh, which is typical with electric motors, can be more prevalent with with these types of of applications and have to be accounted for uh, as you're kind of thinking about the customer comfort. Uh, next, you also need to think kind of on the entire system. Uh, so, you know, not just the sizing of the battery, but placing it, uh, connecting the battery with the with the electric motor, um, and taking a holistic approach or system engineering approach to address all the, um, you know, multidiscipline needs of the of your design becomes very important. Um, and of course, accounting for the overall customer experience in terms of range, 
uh, in terms of the speed of, of charging, um, vibration and noise, as we mentioned, balancing all of all of all of these issues becomes um, you know critically important. And at the end of the day, uh, you know, kind of the, the critical component or one of the most critical components here is choosing the right propulsion system, whether you're going to go full electric or with a hybrid system and sizing that propulsion system properly for your boat uh, is something that you need to kind of you know decide early in the design process. So um, we think that to address these challenges, uh, companies need to adopt an integrated approach for the ship design and engineering. And what we mean by that is you need a fully integrated uh, digital thread. Uh, and we'll see in the examples today with uh, Dr. Miles Wheeler, um, as well as with Pete, um, you know, how we combine different engineering domains, as well as simulation and tests to be able to achieve that and uh, ultimately deliver better designs in a shorter time. And you know, this integrated solution that Siemens provides here combines multi-disciplines and multi-physics. Uh, so what we call the comprehensive digital twin, uh, it allows you to automate the design exploration and optimization process. So you can discover those, uh, you know, highly efficient and reliable designs in a shorter time, as well as, uh, you know, breaking the silos between different disciplines. So you balance your uh, requirements from mechanical, electric, software uh, within an integrated environment. Um, if we look at just one example, uh, one customer study uh, that developed uh, or adopted this approach uh, from Siemens, uh, BART Technologies is, is an engineering consultancy uh, in the UK, and they were facing the challenge of designing a completely new class of yachts uh, with an improved user experience. And thanks to this integrated approach, they were able to um, you know, um, achieve 30% increase in fuel efficiency at cruising speed. Um, they developed the entire uh, kind of uh, workflow, the entire uh, engineering process uh, in a, in a um, much uh, um, uh, shorter time, and of course, improved the collaboration between the uh, teams that in that case have to work uh, remotely. Um, so you'll see here a testimonial from the CTO uh, of BART Technologies about you know, how they consider the uh, you know, optimization processes they uh, deploy as one of their key strengths and how they rely on the suite of tools from Siemens to, um, uh, to develop this optimization process. Um, so before um, turning things to Miles, I'll uh, just say a few words, maybe it's proper to introduce what SimCenter is, uh, because both Miles and Pete will talk a lot about the SimCenter uh, technologies that uh, are implemented in their, in their case studies. Um, so SimCenter is an integrated um, suite of tools uh, for simulation and test that uh, is aimed at helping engineers delivering better products and predicting its performance, optimizing its design, and doing this in a very efficient way. So the capabilities cover a wide range uh, of, of physics and domains. So from you know, computational fluid dynamics to uh, optimize hydrodynamic performance, as well as optimizing the propulsion system, uh, system level simulation tools that allow you to uh, size, model, and predict the dynamic performance of your hybrid and electric powertrain, as well as integrate the, these different components with software and controls and do virtual testing of your entire uh, vessel. Um, and then of course, there are mechanical or FEA solutions uh, that allow you to assess the structural integrity and dynamics, noise and vibration, as well as physical testing uh, for these same domains. Um, and the goal here with SimCenter is that it's very modular, um, but at the same time, there's a lot of value in combining these, as you'll see in the examples shared, shared by Miles. So uh, at this point, I'll uh, uh, move the ball to, uh, to Miles to share uh, more details uh, in terms of the uh, examples uh, for how these technologies are used for designing sustainable watercraft. Hey, thanks, uh, Maggot. I think everybody should be able to see my screen now. Yes? Yes, we can. All right. So, yeah, 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Miles Wheeler. And as uh, Scott and Mag mentioned, I'm a senior marine application specialist at Siemens. And ATA asked me to give some brief insight into the tool sets we have uh, within the Siemens SimCenter portfolio, which may help address the issues engineers and designers face when trying to figure out how to electrify their vessels. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Emil Ahrens, uh, for helping me generate a lot of material you will see here. And Emil actually gave a webinar utilizing how the SimCenter portfolio can be used to design and optimize fast boats just last week, such as the rescue vessel um, shown here. I think it is an excellent presentation that showcases how to use our set of tools to effectively design all aspects of a vessel while allowing for seamless collaboration between both internal colleagues and external vendors. This webinar is available on demand now at the link you see here, and I can write it in the chat later. Uh, but I think anybody interested in designing a uh, high-speed craft would be uh, interested in this webinar. And what I plan to present today builds upon this uh, framework as well. Uh, but let's take the same rescue vessel and zoom into some of the key technologies and problems we must face when determining how to electrify a vessel. The steps involved will be consistent of determining the estimated power by analyzing the hull with our CFD or computational fluid dynamics tool, SimCenter Star CCM Plus. We can then utilize this data with SimCenter AIMSIM, our 1D SIM systems tool, to then determine the absorbed power and efficiency of our propulsion system. We can then determine the powering and battery pack sizing requirements based on the absorbed power and required mission profiles. And we can revalidate the powering estimation by rerunning our CFD analyses with updated weight estimates and then validating our range with a coupled uh, simulation while we also optimize the various parts of the vessel. In the event that we also want to design and electrify the drivetrain, we also have the tools to do both. We can buy a detailed uh, design of a battery pack as well as an electric motor, which I will touch on at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> so the first step I would propose uh, when looking into electrifying a, a vessel is utilizing our virtual tote tank approach within SimCenter Star CCM Plus. SimCenter Star CCM Plus is a powerful multi-physics CFT solver perfectly suited for marine applications. We have several tools within SimCenter Star CCM Plus to model the fully detailed physics of marine hydrodynamics, including the ability to capture the free surface or the air-water interface, and the ability to model the dynamic vessel motions of a watercraft while it is under power. Waves, maneuvering, self-propulsion, calm water resistance, or any combination thereof can be modeled with the same general framework. Siemens and ATA actually did a webinar uh, collaboratively illustrating this framework about a year and a half ago and is available at this link where you can go to ATA's YouTube page to take a detailed look of how it all works. The other advantageous thing about SimCenter Star System Plus is that one can completely parameterize any of the key inputs, such as weight, center of mass, speed, or even hull geometry. And then the simulation can be repeated with the various inputs to see how they affect performance or, and or easily generate resistance uh, and powering versus speed curves with the simple input of parameters with that requires minimal user input, as we see here. So the beauty of having these parameters is that SimCenter Star System Plus simulations can be run repeatedly <clears throat> uh, while looking at any changes in basic boundary conditions or parameters. So in this case, we're setting up a design study that allows us to vary the longitudinal center of gravity position, the mass of the vessel, and the vessel target speed. So for the given mass configuration, we can set LCG and mass to be constant. And then we can explore the resistance of powering characteristics over a wide range of speeds. In this case, we'll try to generate these curves for a range of zero to 60 knots in 2.9 uh, knot increments. And then once that's set up, the only thing we have to do is set up our run settings. So we can ensure that we want to save all of our designs and we can utilize whatever licensing and computing hardware we have. So in this case, we'll run two jobs in parallel on 32 cores each. You can utilize whatever computing races forces you have, or even harness cloud computing to get to your designs very quickly. So once all these runs are completed, that's not for playing, what happened? Oops. Sorry about that, there we go. 
So once all the runs are completed, we have instant access to the required data. And we can assess and look at all of the individual design points with one within a single uh, GUI. We don't have to go down and chase multiple files. They're all provided to you seamlessly within our design manager framework. And then we can look at each individual design to make sure that everything is making sense. And what we are doing now is we've generated the power versus speed curve, as well as the resistance versus speed curve for this vessel operating within the range of zero to 60 knots. <clears throat> and then what we can do is we can take the resistance data and build a simple model with our 1D system modeling software, SimCenter Amesim. This tool allows us to link sea states, vessel performance, different propulsion systems together. So the user can quickly assess the energy losses within the drivetrain and get an understanding of the actual absorbed power, which includes the losses from these drivetrain or propulsion systems, which is the name of the game when it comes to trying to build an electric vehicle. You really need to understand what all your losses are to maximize the operating profile of your electrified vessel. So these models run in actually just a few seconds, uh, as opposed to hours for the CFD simulation. So it is easy to take a different look at any type of option or different configuration quite easily on a simple laptop machine. The way it works is we will build a ship model. And if CFD data was not yet available, empirical models, such as the commonly used Sabisky model, would be, it would be used to estimate the resistance. But since we have high fidelity CFD data of the resistance of this vessel, we can use that instead to get the actual resistance of this vessel when looking into its propulsion system. We can then put any C state we wish and include the added resistance when it comes to waves. Uh, but for the purposes of this demonstration, we will assume it's calm water. And then we can input our propeller model. We can get the characteristics from our propeller supplier uh, and input them directly into the model. And then we can ramp up the rotation rate of the propeller. And then once we do that, we can calculate the speed based on the force balances between the resistance and the thrust coming out of the propeller. And when it's all said and done, we can calculate the combined absorbed power prediction to get an understanding of what the actual powering and energy requirements are for the vessel. And as I mentioned, these models run extremely quickly. So looking at alternative propulsor options can be done quite easily. Perhaps a water jet might be more desirable for both safety and efficiency. This is a search and rescue vessel. You don't want spitting machinery uh, coming in contact with any of the people you're trying to rescue. And it could be that at higher speeds, the um, water jet is actually more efficient. So this is easily done. We simply swapped out the propeller model for a water jet model and reran the exact same analysis. And this is quite telling. We can now see how the two propeller options differ, as well as get some insight into our, our powering pad. So the traditional propeller is actually more efficient at lower speeds, whereas the water jet is more efficient at higher speeds, which is expected. And we can see that if our vessel actually wants to go at higher speeds uh, beyond 40 knots, the power requirement shoots up rather quickly. So that tells us either A, we want this vessel to be limited maybe to around 40 knots, or we need more work to do in order to get better efficiency at higher speeds when it comes to hull design. Um, <clears throat> We can also see relatively low changes in power across uh, 50 knots to around 30 knots. Um, and that is interesting because it tells us that uh, we don't really have a lot of power requirement. We should be able to maximize range at higher speeds through this flattened off power curve. And the interesting thing is that 40 knots between the two different propulsor systems is almost a difference of about 150 horsepower when it comes to power requirement, which is quite telling and is definitely not insignificant. It can really give you a very quick insight into what perhaps the best propulsion option might be. Um, so once we settle in on a suitable propulsor, it is then required to look at various configurations to determine the battery pack sizing. So this simply requires expanding upon the existing model to add in the following. We added in some electric motors, a uh, size of 250 kilowatts, or 335 horsepower based on the propulsion analysis we just did. We can include gear ratios uh, to either look at how they affect the efficiency of the motor to make sure we're operating in the most efficient uh, aspect of the, of, of the motor. And then we can add in a simplified electrochemistry models to mimic the battery behavior. 
We can then import a constant voltage supply and look at how perhaps different voltages affect our, our performance, such as peak amps. Um, so we can figure out the correct voltage size for our battery pack. But of course, these calculations are all dependent on what the vessel is doing. So a mission profile can be entered in, which is simply a velocity versus time profile. That can be varying, constant, accelerating, whatever you want to do, you can analyze very easily by inputting the mission profile in one single place. And then this controller iterates on everything and we can actually then figure out the energy burn during this mission profile, which then gives us a battery pack size calculation. So as an example, uh, we took what I think is a reasonable uh, search and rescue mission, uh, which is looking at the high speed for about a half an hour, intermediate speed for a half hour, uh, operating maybe close to hump speed while you're searching for something, uh, and then running idle time when you're actually rescuing uh, whatever you need to rescue. So this mission profile uh, calculates uh, battery pack size just over 500 kilowatts, so or kilowatt hours, excuse me, um, which says maybe we want to size the pack to be 600 kilowatt hours. This, uh, this mission profile covers a range of about 45 miles over a duration of four hours, which is probably reasonable for this type of vessel. So once we settle in on a battery pack size, we can then take the same model and look at different uh, ranges and run times at various different operating speeds. So the mission profile just became constant velocities over a duration of time. And then we can see how long and how far it takes to reach that peak 600 kilowatt hour energy consumption. So this is pretty telling. So on the left here, I've plotted range uh, in miles versus speed in knots. Uh, and on the right here, I plotted um, how long the vessel will be running for versus its speed. So it's quite interesting to see that due to that flat power band that I showed you earlier, we can actually get higher range at a faster speed as it tapers off. And we don't actually see too much degradation in runtime when we run from say between 20 to 40 knots. It's still mostly around two hours. And of course, one of the interesting things to consider when it comes to electric vessels is our, our margin. So at idle speed, we can actually operate for almost 70 miles um, as well as 20 hours. So if we did have a problem, we ran out of juice, there's still plenty of margin to get us safely back home um, with enough time and enough extra range going at idle speed, which I think is an important thing to consider when designing electric vessels. Um, so once we know the battery pack sizing requirements, we can package it together in whatever CAD program you have, and we can re-get um, the weight estimates with the new LCG estimates and regenerate the resistance versus power curves by simply updating the parameters that I showed you earlier, which is the longitudinal center of mass, as well as the actual mass of the vessel. So once we do that, we can then get our three different powering curves. So this teal one on the bottom is our original powering curve. And we can see how these two battery pack configurations work, one with a rearward um, CG placement and one with a more forward one. You can see the rear one is maybe slightly more efficient, but not too much at higher speeds, uh, as well as much more efficient um, when it comes to, um, or the forward one is more efficient uh, near, near hump speed. But the other nice thing about this is that the CFD runs gives you the transient history of all the metrics. So if we look at each individual design point, we can see if maybe anything is awry. So in this case with the FCG, when I was looking at the pitch history, I noticed that it's oscillating quite a bit. I said, oh, that could be problematic. Whereas the forward CG, the pitch was very constant over the duration of time. So then downloading the video from the CFD analysis, we can actually see that yes, indeed, the rearward CG configuration does cause an uh, dynamic instability and the vessel is indeed porpoising. So this battery pack placement, mass and CG configuration would not be appropriate. And we can say that something needs to be reworked. So what are the, the next steps? The updated mass and resistance properties can be input to repeat the analysis in the same fashion I just did. So in the interest of time, I won't go over the repeat analysis, but you can just keep going with the, the new resistance curve. And we can see if we need to increase the battery pack size significantly or how that might reduce the range of the vessel. 
The alternative is now that we know how much mass we need to add, we can look at using our HEADS optimization software to either minimize the mass or optimize the resistance characteristics of the hull. So here is a video that shows uh, the search and rescue vessel operating in waves. So in the CFD simulation is on the left. So we took a, a wave case, which is the most problematic case for the structural integrity of this vessel. And we map these loads onto a finite element model that was built in SimCenter 3D, uh, our finite element modeling tool. And we can run this load case. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to minimize the mass while making sure that we had a margin of safety <coughs> greater than zero. And we can do this by modifying 29 geometric variables that are related to the hull design. In this case, um, we varied the thicknesses of the critical surfaces on the outer mold of the, of the hull, as well as the thicknesses of the, of the plates, as well as the thickness and shapes of the center girder and the stiffeners. So doing this, we can plug it into HEADS, which is a multidisciplinary um, optimization platform that links multiple CAE tools together seamlessly to either create customized workflows and or optimizations. So at the end of the day, what happened, we were able to run, excuse me, I don't know what happened there. Sorry about this. Okay, there we go. Well, I'm sorry, the uh, video is not working, but we can recoup the mass. So basically what we did is we, we see that it, we, we uh, recover the mass by iterating on these thicknesses to really reduce the mass. We saved about 2000 pounds, uh, which is very close to what the battery pack size was. So we can actually optimize the mass there to uh, recover our mass. And we can do the same thing either with our propulsion system, our driveline system, and or the hydrodynamic shape of the hull in order to regain the hydrodynamic efficiency. So, after that, we can then either pick a battery pack from a supplier, which I think is a common thing to do, and maybe the status quo of industry. And then the detailed information can be put into a sim center aim sim to then get detailed information about how voltage drops, how fast it will discharge, uh, and how that will affect things such as peak amperage and that sort of thing. Um, and then we can look at that in detail. SimCenter Star System Plus and SimCenter AIMSIM can also be linked together to perform a real world realistic virtual C trial test. And that is done by linking the SimCenter library to Star CCM Plus. Uh, my videos seem to be not working. Hmm. Sorry about that. Um, don't know why my video stopped working. We were working earlier. Miles, perhaps yeah. you can try playing the video outside of full screen. Oh, if, yeah. If that... Okay, hold on. Okay, so here's showing us how to link um, the SimCenter library together. So here we are linking our water jet model of the drivetrain to uh, Star CCM Plus via FMU coupling. And then what happens is it creates a library and we can link the parameters into the simulation together. So what we are doing here is the, we are linking the CFD to the FMU links. So the inputs from AIMSIM are the displacement and velocity. And then we can go through and now create a, a linked model uh, together. And then what happens is we can run the simulated virtual C trial test. Um, And we can actually see any and all metrics from either the drivetrain or the resistance data are now available. And we can uh, 
look at real world C trial tests in any type of configuration, maneuvering configuration that uh, we might uh, want to see. So I will now try to redo this. Sorry about this, this is quite long. So now it seems to be working, okay. So yeah, so you can perform virtual C trial tests by linking it all together to understand real world behavior that includes the complete drivetrain and the best. Now I did briefly want to touch upon what happens if you want to design the battery pack and the electric motor. Uh, SimCenter Star System Plus does have the complete entire workflow available to allow us to uh, go from our CAD mesh uh, solution. We have very fast solvers to look at things such as thermal protection, electrochemistry, thermal runaway. We can do the analysis, and then once it's all said and done, we can export our battery pack design into SimCenter Amson to then go through and repeat these calculations with our own custom designed battery pack. We can look at things such as fast charging, which I think are critical in the marine world, things such as fire protection and thermal runaway. We can look at how to effectively optimize our cooling systems and as well as our mass optimization for a given energy requirement. And we can also look at anything for ventilation effects and everything else. We do have the complete tool set to do so. And here we have an example of a thermal runaway under a constant voltage charging profile. So it's a constant voltage and then it improves the, the amps at the end. And then we can see exactly what the cooling system has done. We can see exactly how hot the batteries are get. And then we can look at fast charging and see if there's any issues with thermal management or battery pack. And the electric motor, uh, we do have the tools within SimCenter MotorSolve. So the first step of any design process begins with a set of objectives. The constraints. Some of these constraints include the volume, the available power supply and materials, speed profile, cooling methods, any CAD files or data sheets um, that are available to the designer. These objectives and constraints are then used to define the model by selecting the motor type and define the motor geometry from built-in edible rotor and stator templates. If a user's design is not available in the list of templates, it can be imported into it. And after defining the model, the motor is uh, then designed by adding the rotor and stator templates, the winding, which is one of MotorSolve's strongest features. And then the design is analyzed through a comprehensive list of performance results. For example, global results like cogging torque, torque envelopes and efficiency maps, as well as local field analysis like magnetic loading, demagnetization and thermal fields are generated with simple uh, clicks. Details of various analysis options uh, have been developed through consultations with the world's leading motor designers with decades of practical experience to fit a designer's persona. The design can be iterated on and calibrated and exported into the drivetrain with high fidelity that supports both software and hardware in the loop for motor models. The model, of course, can be exported into SimCenter AIMSIM to improve upon the design of our sophisticated drivetrain system, which I just demonstrated and exported into CFD analysis, uh, FEA analysis, and SimCenter 3, 3D, as well as other third-party tools. So the automation results are fast and easy to learn, uh, pretty intuitive if you're trying to design the motor yourself. And SimCenter Motor solves uh, parameter accessibility, scriptability, and APIs facilitates connect connectivity uh, for multi-physics and co-simulations with any other, the other tools within the SimCenter portfolio. Uh, by embedding solvers and design and analysis workflows uh, and, and optimizations with other third-party tools when needed. So thank you very much. Here's my contact information and we can now pass it off to uh, Peter. Thank you, Miles. My pleasure. Uh, I was gonna talk uh, about two topics kind of briefly here. One is uh, the effect of these new electrified powertrains on in-cabin noise, and then a little bit about uh, pass-by noise testing in the uh, marine industry. Uh, basically, when you go from a combustion-based uh, motor to a uh, electric motor, there is a bit of a shift in the frequency content of the, uh, of the sound emitting from the propulsion unit. 
And so I think it, it was uh, Maggot who mentioned, you know, we are going to get these uh, annoying tones. So before we had things like very low orders from an engine, kind of a rumble, uh, something like that. That's a diesel engine. I did a very bad job there. And now we're replacing it. Instead of that low frequency rumble, we're going to have high frequency tones typically get emitted from electric motors. So more of a, a whiny noise, Whoa, something like that. Did you like my sound effects there, Scott? You could... Perfect, couldn't be better. Okay, good. I wanted to illustrate the point uh, in some way. So, uh, so this means that uh, when you're, you know, in the traditional marine industry, you did have some high frequency tones when people had uh, two row chargers, you had gear sets that sometimes, you know, with these many teeth as they ran around, created uh, tones. Uh, you probably didn't really have mosquitoes out on the water. But now we have an electric motor, you know, creating these high frequencies tones. We still have gears. And, you know, if you're a luxury yacht owner, you know, I, I guess I talked to some people in the industry. Apparently, they're very picky uh, people. You know, if you spent $30 million on a... Uh, a luxury yacht, for example, you don't want to hear these tones as you're sleeping in your master suite on these boats. So the tones can be annoying. So there's new ways, I guess, to assess the tonality component, because you're going to maybe change physical parts and things like that to see if you can reduce the impression of these tones uh, on a signal. Now, now here you can see something like uh, the blue signal doesn't really have tones, the red does. Basically, the way these uh, metrics work, you would probably guess it would say the red signal is going to have uh, more tones in it. And it does this by, you know, if I zoom in here a bit, we take a, a sound signature that we might measure or we could generate it in simulation. We look at uh, an individual frequency and we see if that sticks out relative to the neighboring sound. And in this case, I'd, I'd wager, hopefully all of you would say, it's not, uh, that gold uh, frequency is not sticking out. And then we go over here and yeah, it's probably sticking out a little bit, but what happens is if it doesn't stick out enough relative to its neighbors, you don't perceive it as a tone. Instead, it just kind of melds in with the background noise. Uh, so as I go up here, you can see like over here, there is a tone that is much higher than its neighbors. And typically, you know, sound is measured in decibels or dB. We would say if it sticks seven dB higher, you know, than the neighboring uh, background noise, then we have a tone and a distinct tone that somebody might get annoyed by. And this is kind of interesting. A combustion engine could even be louder in total dB than an electrified powertrain. But if it doesn't produce distinct tones, uh, people would say it sounds more pleasant. Whereas with all these electrified powertrains, as we reduce, you know, as it naturally reduces the sound levels, things like tones stick up more. So this, these tonal characteristics become more and more important in the engineering. And they're often discovered late, late in late stage in the uh, development of a, a yacht or any kind of ship, a recreational boat, for example, there are published uh, metrics for tones. So ECMA 74 is a standard, and it basically, a user can go in, identify a tone, and again, it has to be a certain amount above the background to uh, be a noticeable as a distinct tone. So uh, you look at it relative to the background, see how much it sticks out by, and leave in here it says uh, this, for this particular metric, it needs to be 8 dB above the background. Again, it doesn't matter if this thing is 60 dB absolute value or 50 dB. What matters is the difference relative to background for the tone. Okay. Maybe just to give you an idea, this is a, uh, uh, a plot generated in SimCenter test lab, and it's what we call an active picture plot. So I can double click on it and I can interact with the data. That means I can zoom in and I can uh, zoom back out 
I can also put on cursors and read out the data values. So this is the uh, spectrum from a ship's sound. And I can go over a tone here. And looking at this graph, you wouldn't be able to tell that whether that is a audible tone, distinctly noticeable or not. But I can calculate this tone to noise ratio by clicking here. And it's saying this is 4 dB, 4.75 dB above the background noise in this area. So it would not stick out as a tone. As recalled, it had to be 8 dB above the background. Now, I know it's hard to remember numbers like 8 uh, and see if it's above or below. So we also added an option for any kind of manager or other people involved where we simply say, no, there is no tone. So it's a yes, no thing. So if I go to this other tone here, notice it's 9 dB above the background and the cursor there changes to uh, yes. So rather than look at the spectrum and guess, I can definitely tell where distinct tones are. If I know this is the tone of the electric motor, I know to go after it. It could be the tone of an alternator or something else. So by identifying the frequency, seeing if it's uh, noticeable as a tone, we know how to address the, the problem or which component to address it. Okay. Hopefully that made sense so far. And by the way, electric motors, they like to produce all sorts of fun uh, tones. You can see here, this is at about 5,000 Hertz, a relatively high frequency. This is, this looks like a chicken foot here. And what we have here is the RPM. So we're sweeping uh, the speed of the electric motor. And we have frequency along this axis. And then the amplitude of sound is denoted over here. And this thing is actually what they call PWM signal or power electronic generated noise, which also uh, can show up, uh, not just tones from the motor, but from the power electronics that control it. So that's not uh, here, down here are all the normal motors. These are moving up proportionally in speed with this RPM. These, however, start out at a high frequencies because the electronics fire up at a certain frequency and create additional tones. So those might be some of the things that we would be looking at. Now, uh, pass by noise on ships also create some fun challenges for acoustics, but instead of thinking about the occupants and whether they, uh, what kind of sound they're experiencing inside the ship. This is for the people that are living nearby, et cetera. There are regulations that uh, dictate how much sound a ship can generate X distance away, particularly for uh, recreational boats. And typically the way these things get uh, done is people will uh, drive a boat back and forth a microphone is placed on land here that picks up the sound levels being emitted from this uh, ship. There's a weather station as well. You would monitor things like wind speed and temperature because these affect, you know, a gust of wind will create a lot of sound on a microphone. And so we need to not accept any results that would be artificially high. And depending on the temperature, the boat operates differently and can produce more or less noise. People that are doing this uh, certification to make sure they can sell a boat. So it's pretty important uh, activity for a boat manufacturer to meet the regulations. They want that to be potentially a single operator information uh, operation. They want to know if they've passed or failed immediately if they can. And the operator needs to be able to focus on the test. So there's some challenges. Luckily, uh, Siemens uh, along with ATA, we have this nice uh, pass by noise solution from Sim Center with lots of nice gadgets, lots of fun things you can do for uh, recording things, including things like a wireless mic here, a weather station, things that digitize the sound from these microphones at high speed. And uh, I'll just explain how we address some of these challenges. So, Instead of having someone sitting here on shore monitoring the microphone and the weather station, basically with this wireless microphone here, we can transmit out to the boat what the sound levels are in real time, as well as the weather information. So wireless telemetry, if you will, uh, going onto the boat, 
And then on the boat, you would have a unit that's recording the microphones, but it would also have a GPS. And what's interesting about this is you can set up Google Earth-based triggers for one to start and stop the test because there's regulations on how far away it has to be when it starts and stop the test. And then there's regulations you have to be at a certain speed. And obviously GPS also picks up speed and that will tell you if you're within the prescribed speed. Hopefully that uh, makes sense. So that's a typical kind of challenge people have. And if I double click on this, uh, you know, one nice thing about GPS data is you can flag it over to Google Earth, for example. And so uh, in this case, I can see where this uh, pass by noise test was done. You know, it's on this river right along here. And then we can take a look, for example, you know, from the test data that I recorded, I could see if, was I at a constant speed? And it looks like in this particular case, 33, 35 miles per hour, it was pretty constant and within the prescribed uh, limits, for example. I hope that uh, all made sense. You know, people will look at the data afterwards and see if they met the, the sound regulation. They'll look at things like this to be able to pinpoint a particular component if it's causing them to go over with like a post-processing analysis. Okay, thank you. And uh, Scott, I'll let you, uh, or maybe you wanna summarize or take over here. Actually, I'll cheat here and ask a question of my own before we get to the Q and A. Um, how does the lack of masking from the you know loud, typical, you know, gas inboard engine that's being replaced by the electric drive. We all know the electric drives are, are tremendously quieter, but the nature of the noise is different. When you're not masking that, uh, those, uh, you know, the, the annoying frequencies, if you will, by this loud engine noise, um, you know, how do we characterize that, that change from being masked to not being masked and, and what does an engineer do about it? Well, I think, uh, first of all, the what I've mentioned here was that there are metrics to assess the tonal character, right? The lack of masking causes components that are operating on the boat to be more noticeable as distinct tones, right? So tonality was one calculation. There was also this tone to noise metric. So did that make sense so far, Scott? Oh, sure. Yep. Yeah. And then... What to do about it is you go out and you hire experts like ATA right away to solve the problem. That's the <laughs> good answer. Any other uh, questions? Well, I think we'll we'll uh, jump into the uh, into the Q and A now. Um, hold on, just a second here. I've got to get to. to share my screen again. Okay, so now we'll we'll launch into the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Pete, for that interesting explanation. I can sense your enthusiasm, and I believe you could probably go on for two hours uh, and keep it all interesting, but unfortunately, we only have a few minutes left here for Q&A. Um, we are happy to take your questions later. I will have contact information shown shortly. And uh, we're happy to get back to you and, and answer any questions we didn't have time for today. Uh, I'm going to start with the first question that was asked, which was uh, by Taylor. And he actually asked several in uh, succession, and they're probably addressed at you, Miles. Uh, are the CFD cal uh, computations done under towed or self-propelled conditions? Uh, both. So at the beginning, I did just a bare hole resistance calculation. So that would be essentially a toad condition. And the reason for that is when I then took that data and put it into the drivetrain model, the drivetrain actually asked for bare hole resistance data. So of course there's things such as thrust deduction that are of concern, but the, the model actually assumes thrust deduction uh, at that point in time. And then what happens is once we add in the propulsor, so as later in the presentation, when I was showing you um, how to link the coupled simulations together, and that last video of the boat operating in waves, that's under full power with engine effects included. So that's you know the whole entire system modeled together. 
So SimCenter Sim Star System Plus allows you to model um, anything from bear hull resistance to fully propelled with the motor, dynamic motor characteristics. Now we understand that most prop manufacturers hold their um, open water uh, prop performance data highly proprietary and, and it's, it's very difficult to get them to part with it. But so what, what are other ways that you could recreate the open water prop performance to use in your models? Well, it's pretty easy to get the geometry. And then uh, if you do get the geometry, either via scan or your sub propeller supplier will give it to you. They seem to be more open to that than generally giving you open water propeller data. Um, you can actually run a CFD analysis very quickly. Um, it just takes a, a few hours to get the entire open water characteristics uh, and that can be used instead. And then um, you can use that to compare two different props, for example, for the same power package. Yep, that's one way to do it. Or there's a traditional series propellers in existence in, in literature um, that you can also use instead. And those models are available within SIP Center AIMSIM when looking at uh, you know, your, your drive drivetrain configurations. Thank you. And uh, Taylor's last uh, of his series of questions is, are CFD results shared with the propeller manufacturers to establish propeller design? Yes, you can. And then actually in the webinar that was given last week, that exact scenario is discussed and, the, and, and a way to seamlessly share that with your propeller supplier is, is showcased in that webinar. So via our accelerator share, um, tool, which I, I did not get into in my presentation. Um, we can take our data, pass all relevant data to our, our propeller supplier, and they can take that data and help you pick out the appropriate propeller. Terrific. And I know it's, it's public information that Mercury is a big customer of Siemens, not of ATA. They're a direct Siemens client, but uh, I know that they've been using STAR for quite a long time. Uh, I would imagine they may use AIMSIM as well. And next, uh, we had a, a couple of questions uh, from Matt. Uh, Miles, you answered one of these already, but uh, maybe I could ask you to answer it aloud uh, for the purposes of the recording and the, uh, the rest of our participants. Uh, the question was, can you speak to the profiling of propellers and water jets should the data not be available? And I realize you just answered part of that question. You run the calculation in uh, in CFD. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, SimCenter AIMSIM does give you sort of the unique ability to model with whatever details you do have. So it could just be anything from a single point force um, to open water curves, or you can use an existing model I think one of the nice things about SimCenter AIMSIM is that it does come with a database of many common engines, water jets, propellers that you can use from an existing database if you don't have any information yet um, as an estimate. Um, of course, you know, as you get more information about whatever you're simulating, the more high fidelity your simulation will be. But I do think that SimCenter AIMSIM is actually set up very well to start with something just maybe off a spec sheet and iterate through all the way into complete details of the model once you obtain them, or you can stop at whatever intermediate point you have, depending on how much information you can actually get. But AIMSIM also has built in models for the batteries and the uh, motors and all of that stuff as well, right? Yeah, there's databases of things to choose kind of off the shelf. Uh, kind of like as a, a Lego as a, building block sort of a thing. Yeah, there's several models to choose um, from the database as a starting point. Very good. And uh, we have one more question here from Matt, which I'll read aloud. But if, if there are any more questions, uh, participants are encouraged to ask them. You can type them into the Q&A chat, uh, the Q&A tab or the webinar chat. Or if you would like to, uh, to ask your question aloud, just uh, kind of raise your hand and Jonathan will unmute you so you can uh, be heard. So this question is also from Matt. It says, can you speak to the abilities of analyzing very small hull features in varying C states in a full free motion environment, such as fine tuning chines and strakes, interceptors versus trim tabs, even asymmetric features, 
And using heeds to zero in on the best combination of efficiency versus stability, slam mitigation, or other operational objectives. Yeah, sure. Um, SimCenter Star System Plus has the ability to model all these fine details. There is no restriction on geometry or appendages. Um, obviously, or I think it should be obvious that uh, as you add in small features, and things like that, your, you know, the fidelity of your model is going to increase. So you're likely going to have to build a finer mesh around these features and that sort of thing. So uh, I think in my presentation, I demonstrated the models run in five hours, but maybe it takes, you know, a few more hours than that to get a, a good model running. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no limitation to what you can model. You just need to make sure you capture everything with enough fidelity. So then such as fine tuning, um, chine, strikes, interceptors, that sort of thing. Um, you can look at doing design sweeps with these pretty easily. So if you have a different placement of a chine, you can regenerate your powering or speed curve or whatever you're interested in investigating. Maybe it's slamming load stability. And then when it comes to heats, so long as you can parameterize uh, what you're doing, um, you can run an optimization. So every optimization has to have a clearly defined objective as well as clearly defined constraints. Once we can do that, then we can use heeds to, to, to do that. So that's uh, not the problem. It's just making sure you have a clear definition of what you want to, what you want your optimization objective to be, which I think often is uh, actually the hardest thing to figure out at the end of the day. Terrific. Thanks, Miles. Uh, this is our, gonna be our last question, folks. I'm sorry, but we are. Uh, after we are uh, past our, our scheduled time. Um, this question comes from Bronwyn Miles. It says, does SimCenter have a method to generate slash modify propeller geometry for optimization of performance or does one need to upload new geometries obtained independently? Uh, that there's multiple answers to this. So you could just do multiple geometries. That's completely... Uh, doable. So if you had maybe 10 propellers you want to try, um, we can just link to a file parameter that points to that propeller and we can run those. Uh, if you can parameterize your propeller with in CAD and have parameters, um, we can also optimize the propeller using those parameters that vary the shape. We have examples of how to do that in NX. And then if maybe you just have a, a dummy surface uh, of a propeller, we actually can use um, either freeform technology to do more of a geometrical optimization, or we can use our adjoint solver. The adjoint solver will work for a propeller in an open water condition um, and will allow us to actually fine tune the shape to get to better propeller performance by morphing the mesh and morphing the surface to figure out a better operator profile. We have examples of all this that we would be happy to share with any potential customers or current customers. Great, thank you, Miles. Well, thank you everyone for participating in this afternoon's ATA Educational Webinar, Optimization of Watercraft with Hybrid and Battery Electric Drives.